Hello again. So this month, we got something special. We're going to talk about comics, composition, and storytelling. In order to do that, I decided to crack the old comic toolbox back open and do a couple of pages, or at least start the process, and take you with me um, of telling uh, a little two-page story of uh, sort of an anecdote of Professor Akers, the candy man, uh, entering the soup for the first time this does is it gives us an opportunity to sort of take a look at the soup, get to design some of that space a little more thoroughly than I have in the past, bring in some of the characters uh, that I've really enjoyed designing over the last couple of months, like the Pondy Merc Flaps and Puddle Jumpers, and uh, explore a little bit of how the soup and the characters uh, interact together, visually and, and story-wise. So right now I've sped up the first part of the process, which is just me laying in the thumbnails. Don't worry, I know this is breezing by, we're going to talk about every aspect of this. One of the things I realized is that I needed for this story a younger design for Professor Akers himself. So I decided to go a little bit Bob Ross and a little bit young Charles Darwin. That was kind of the vibe I wanted to, uh, to hit with him having one of his first experiences of poking his head into this other world of jelly for the first time. Tried to bring in some of those classic costume elements, but still make it sort of a, a spacesuit. I wanted him to feel overdressed, like this was very serious overkill for the occasion. So a lot of people have asked and, and brought um, illustrations to the Discord for critique uh, that have had to do with storytelling and composition. Uh, it's a common theme for illustration and uh, comics as well, though not as much for character design. Uh, people ask a lot about, and I, I've really wanted to talk more about it because it's something that um, I had some really great teachers on and, and really felt like I learned a lot over the course of my experience with art school. Uh, and then just figuring out things like the Dawn Gate Chronicles um, along the way. So right now I'm just sort of outlining the separate panels so it's clear. I know from a really loose thumbnail it's pretty difficult to see. The first panel is an extreme close-up, Professor Akers poking his head in. The second is a, a big wide establishing shot. Uh, we move from very close to very far. Um, ultimately the second page it builds in tension and then we do a huge big reveal uh, as the Pondy Merc flap takes off leaving a startled and amazed Professor Akers. Uh, and as we go and I, I walk through it, it's a sped up process because I <laughs> took a while doing this, uh, even though it's pretty loose. Uh, and I didn't want to necessarily make this an entire hour long uh, comics chat. One of the things I love about comics in particular is the way that the composition is a little bit like music. It has a rhythm. It has a, a beat to it. Um, it's hard to explain that not being a musician myself, but the size, scale, and placement of the different panels can be uh, an emotional experience when you're reading it. Uh, and that's something that I've always uh, wanted to capture in my work and something that I was trying to demonstrate here. So this first panel, we enter with Acres. Uh, we immediately have a character, a close-up, um, something sort of strange. He's emerging from this sort of rippling pool. He's in a helmet. So we have a couple of questions for this first panel. It's nested within the larger one because I wanted that second establishing shot to be really um, immersive and enveloping. I wanted that first uh, little curious image of him poking his head through, kind of looking around to give us a sense of being there with him, something a little more intimate that uh, put us in that space with him. The second one, obviously, he's poking his head in, and even he is a character right in this first part of the scene. We're in his head. He's, he's nervous. He doesn't know what he's going to find. So we don't want to use a shot that's going to reveal immediately what he does find. We want the reader uh, you guys, as you're reading it, to have the same experience that he is as he's coming through this portal. First he doesn't see everything, and then suddenly he finds himself in a world far beyond uh, anything he's ever seen or known before. So the second shot as he steps through the portal into the world, um, 
I noodle a lot in the sort of thumbnail. And again, I'm, I'm making these a little clearer for the purposes of doing this video than I would for myself as thumbnails or even uh, working with a, a partner. But this is actually an opportunity for me to do the design work that I've been wanting to do for the soup itself. In this thumbnail, even with that said, I, I didn't want to get too lost in the woods of figuring out um, the nitty gritty of the design. The point of this stage, uh, and the stage that's led up to it, the, the very loose stage, which I definitely advise starting at with comics. Um, you'll notice in that first part of the video I did a lot of cropping and re-piecing together and shoving things, panels around. Um, that was to sort of establish the pace and the sense of, of space as I was going, uh, which I'll be talking about as we go forward. Um, that's so much more easy with a really loose some thumbnail where you don't spend all the time getting into the, the little details and foliage and stuff like that. And even here, I'm knocking this stuff in, but mostly it's there as a placeholder or kind of a reminder of how I want to set things up as we go forward. So the pacing here sort of works very simply. A really close staccato, quick beat, then a big kind of brassy, huge establishing shot. Then this long panel, this mid shot that we'll get to next, is uh, again we go back to the intimate kind of closer space with Acres. He's interacting with the environment um, with these puddle jumpers that fly past him. Then we get even closer in uh, for the panel after that, and then the following one. Uh, you'll find that uh, those little narrow panels, um, while they're intimate, can also be. Uh, a good way to stress people out. With composition, we in the West read left to right. So when you're looking at something, uh, you expect the action to sort of flow subtly in that direction, from left to right, the way you would read a sentence. Uh, it sort of applies visually, and, and there's a couple of rules that um, help to enforce that with composition. Uh, that's why, you know, Acres, the first uh, little panel is very narrow. He's squished in there and kind of trapped in that close-up so that it's a tense questioning moment. We don't see too much. The reveal is, uh, you know, compositionally it's showing us a very little man in a very big world. Even from the loose thumbnail, it's telling us that. Uh, I think it's a successful thumbnail because of that, because it's we're moving from very close to very wide, but we're also doing that with a purpose, because the purpose is the emotional moment when he realizes where he is suddenly the world is expanding we want to see it he wants to see it and at the same moment we do so the composition reflects that it's a big wide one which is sort of relaxing it's not a dangerous scene it's not stepping into a world of peril I wanted it to feel like uh, a kind of a moment of awe and a moment of, of uh, sort of breathing deeply and taking it in to riff on that, the panel following, this um, sort of flock of uh, puddle jumpers flies past him and he gets caught up in them a little bit. And I wanted to feature uh, that specific sort of in motion element. The rest of the environment is pretty static. He comes through this sort of interesting circular portal, but there's not much to inspect there. The only thing that's moving in the scene, and you'll see I'll, I'll add them in green pretty quickly here. Um, are these puddle jumpers, these sort of flying uh, little puddles, essentially. If, you've, if you scroll back into the Patreon, you'll find a couple of designs that uh, were creatures from the soup that are essentially made of jelly. Here they are right there. Um, that imitate puddles or bodies of water, but actually are, are living jelly creatures themselves. So here we have that shot and to lead us into the space and kind of draw our eye two acres and beyond into the environment this sort of flapping sort of flock is uh, up close to camera on the right side here and sort of lead us in a sort of big visual triangle directly to acres and then deeper into the environment beyond It's just a, one of those ways to add depth to the space, to play that foreground, middle ground, and background against each other, to give a sense of uh, immersion. You know, there's, it's really easy 
to compose um, as though everything were on a flat plane and kind of next to each other. A lot of sitcoms are composed that way. If you think of The Simpsons or Family Guy, everything is evenly sized and scaled and kind of placed um, on a single plane. There's not a lot of depth going on. That's uh, done for budget reasons, but also for emotional reasons. It's, it's funnier, a mid-shot like that, to have things all sort of normal. For whatever reason, in storyboarding, uh, what I'm told, and my fiance is a storyboard artist, so she does way better than I do, uh, but that's actually a lot funnier. So I've been thinking about that as I go. Moments of drama uh, are a lot easier to create when you move the camera around. Uh, you move far out or very close in. That's something that I, I really love in the work of people I admire in terms of composition. So uh, Mike Mignola, who does Hellboy, does a lot of, of really dramatic comp composing with his point of view in his comics. The movie Prince of Egypt uh, frames some really beautiful shots in terms of light and dark. Uh, similarly, very dramatic, not very sort of flat comedy kind of angles. Um, and those are the sorts of things that I envision Jellybots having both. And so I wanted this moment of Acres to move emotionally from a moment of awe and sort of pausing you visually into a moment of a little bit of playful kind of comedy. So we're still in that awe space. So now we've gone from this big shot to a narrower shot. Uh, emotionally, uh, the shot's, oh, well, it's a wide shot. I shouldn't say it's narrow, but it's... Um, expansive, it's broad, and a broad shot again gives us a sense of uh, ease. It tends to. The narrower sort of squished vertically shots are a little more of a staccato beat. They, they're, they're quicker. So these uh, puddle jumpers are, are flying past him and he has a moment where he sort of reaches out and sort of touches one and his finger goes right through. Um, he gets to appreciate the environment. It's still this wide space we're enjoying it. This shot here, he's looking down suddenly. Something is disturbing him from below. There's probably going to be a sound effect, some color to indicate that something sudden and abrupt has happened. So likewise, the composition of this shot is abrupt. It's short. It's added on, tacked on to the row. Um, so it's uh, it stops the, the left to right read quickly so that... Uh, as you're reading it, you go from, oh, wow, to like, oh, oh, what's this? And that's intentional. It's part of the rhythm trying to build as we go through this. As I'm going as well, and, and what I did in the early thumbnails here, uh, I'm thinking a lot about value structure. Value structure is, you know, the relative light and dark uh, and how that uh, makes things clear or obscures things and makes them difficult to read. In comics with composition, Really, in composition at all, when you're trying to tell a story, uh, clarity is everything. So it's really important, first and foremost, that every composition and panel be obvious. And it, maybe that's frustrating artistically in some ways, because you want to be decorative or add complicating elements and layers and, and beautiful detail. Um, but comics, I find, uh, are more successful when you pull back on that impulse a little bit and allow the clarity to, to rule the day. So each shot has a purpose, and that purpose needs to be achieved. Then detail can be added, and if you add detail, it needs to reinforce the point of the shot. This shot that I'm working on right now, we're looking down with him at his feet. It's a longer shot than the previous one. It's not a staccato. It's kind of a, a moment there might be a sort of high string at this point um, that increases in the following shot. Uh, we're still in that, oh, oh, what's going on? What's, oh, he's standing in something? And it's, you know, in the finished one, it'll look like he's standing in this uh, small pond that was in that uh, second big establishing shot. The whole point of that shot is to show the reader what Akers is seeing. So if I don't successfully do that, doesn't matter how nice the boots are or how good the perspective is or any of that if I'm not making it very clear what the story is uh, then I failed uh, with, a, with a comic that way 
So here from the thumbnail, I already knew where I was going to place these creatures, but now I'm laying them in. And green, uh, this is especially for you guys so that you can see more clearly uh, where those elements are. Because when it's in lines like this, it can get pretty complicated pretty fast. So light and dark are one way that you can control the clarity, but color is another one. Uh, that green against the, uh, the the lines here and this blue that I'm using for the big Pondy Merc flap, uh, those are colors that are helping me remember as well that I'm intending to make sure that each character and creature has a distinct color palette so that they're easy to find and track in each shot. There's so many things going on, uh, but one of them is wanting to make sure that when you see each panel you know exactly where Acres is, exactly where the Merc Flap is, um, the Puddle Jumpers, again the silly names for the, the creatures here, but uh, and part of that is color. That's a big part of that. Silhouette is another aspect of design that helps us immediately identify. You'll always know where Mickey Mouse is no matter what what you're looking at. So here I've already sort of sketched a really loose pose for Hagers. Um, this shot, this last shot, uh, I think it's shot six on this page. Um, I should probably say panel six, right? I'm using the wrong lingo. Uh, is a is a wide mid shot. So the point of this one is we we need to see the whole scene. We've emotionally tracked with Acres for the last three panels. We've had his moment where he's in awe with these things flying past him. We've had the moment where he's startled, and then we've had the moment where we look with him at his legs and the puddle that he's standing in. Now we're moving out to more of a narrator's perspective and seeing fully, as he sees fully, or starts to realize what's happening. And what's happening is the pond he's standing in is waking up. Um, another sort of we're not in Kansas anymore aspect of the soup is that the ponds can get up and fly away. Uh, and that was sort of the storytelling feature I wanted to play with in this moment. As he comes in to explore and kind of poke around and see what the world's all about, I wanted him to very quickly encounter something that kind of turns his idea of the world upside down. And any character would react very differently to that kind of a moment. I think for Acres that's the other point of this little two-page comic, is that he's delighted. Like, this is, you know, everyone deals with change differently, but I think Acres has always wanted this kind of adventure and wonder and strangeness in the world. So the shot I've figured out here, we move from left to right. A funny thing about that is if you place a character sort of crammed into the right side of the composition, I have in this final shot on this page, they can feel uh, trapped. That's a good place um, to make them uh, feel uh, compressed, because the force of this huge line is taking up the most of the composition. This huge uh, sort of wavy line of the, the pond waking up. Uh, and it's making him feel under threat. He's not centered, which would make him feel maybe a little more in control or powerful, potentially. There's all kinds of ways you can use this, and it's not a hard and fast rule. Um, but just trying to throw him off balance, literally, in the composition so that he uh, feels surprised. You can get the sense of like, whoa, 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 what's going on? The background here I'm knocking in just sort of loosely to make sure we understand where we are relative to the shot we've already established. The portal is a good way to determine that. He's, you know, stepped forward a couple steps beyond the portal by now, so it's a little bit behind him. And it's a good opportunity, as I'm thinking about it, to frame his silhouette against the glowing shape of this round portal that he's just come through. So I try to place it in the shot behind him in a way that's going to help feature him most prominently because his pose is important. But the most important thing beyond his pose and his facial expression in the shot is that the water isn't water and it's moving. So that's the, the main thesis of this visual panel. And so again, that's if I don't 
communicate that first and foremost, then I've I've lost the battle. So the composition here uh, makes him smaller and the water much larger. Sometimes it's as simple as that. The things you want to emphasize, find a way to make them bigger in the panel if you can, if it makes sense with the flow of the, the narrative so far. Uh, I was playing with the color there. I'm not sure in the final what color I want this uh, body of water to be, but I do know that I want it to be very clear and easy to track because in this next shot, when you turn the page, uh, I want you to immediately understand, based on the color cue, that it's the same thing uh, that he was just standing in that's now flying away. With comics, you don't have the luxury of getting all of the panels you might want into the space. You need to be careful and clever about what you're drawing and how it sequences so that it's clear. There are tricks, um, and one of them, like I mentioned earlier, is that color coding, uh, as well as silhouette. You always know where Batman is. You don't necessarily have to show, uh, you know, every step Batman takes to track where he's going because he has those great pointy bat ears, uh, his horns. Uh, in this case, um, the color I want you to track is this blue, the greens and the blues of this body of water lifting off into the sky. This is, you know, an even more extreme version of that establishing shot from page one. Now we've got a much more vertical thing. It's instead of a being a broad uh, exploring composition, now we have a vertical dynamic composition. I actually, I always really like composing in verticals. I think that's because I always loved comics. I find horizontals sometimes are difficult for me to think in. Um, but this shot, you know, puts him, again, it's a, a small, small man against a big world he doesn't understand. So we'll throw him into silhouette in the foreground here. And we will look with him at this incredible thing that's just happened. And we'll get the opportunity to flesh out the world again from a different angle. Now we're looking out beyond this little um, this little uh, copse of, of trees and mushrooms and this little pond. Now we're looking out into the world. And so that's gonna be a fun opportunity as we move forward to design that space. And here I'm, I'm working on his pose all these things do tend to adjust with each phase of the process. It's not important to me that I get everything exactly right to be inked, because I'm going to be doing the whole comic. I'm not passing this off to a separate inker or somebody else who's going to finish this drawing for me. Uh, so I get to explore a little bit more loosely um, how I want him to pose, what his proportions are going to be, trying to make sure that he feels right. I think right here I had a little bit of a problem with the layering. I wound up drawing on the wrong layer, so I had to cut the um, the puddle jumper out and put it on its new layer and, and crop him again. In doing that, I realized that his proportions were a little bit funny. I, I felt like his arms got a little bit meaty and chunky on me, and he looked more like a, a brawler uh, than I, I liked. The, you know, I, he's chunky, and that was fun, especially chunky up top, and I wanted that. But I, the two things I want to communicate with his pose, I want it to be a neutral one. I don't want it to necessarily be like, you know, him in like a Spider-Man crouch. Uh, that's just my taste. I, I prefer, you know, uh, a little more subtlety. Um, I want the hands and the posing of that to sort of tell us a little bit about him kind of again pausing in in shock we don't see his face so we don't yet know how he feels about what's just happened uh is he terrified uh is he angry is he you know we're not really sure so i'm playing with his arms here to help uh explain a little bit but also give us a little bit of mystery about how he's feeling if that makes sense I have always loved uh, pages where you turn the page, and the act of turning the page is a, a, 
powerful narrative experience uh, if you're tracking. So with this, this was, was like that. I wanted to build some tension and then imagine that you might be turning to the second page. Um, and even visually, if it were next to it, you're still kind of moving over to a new uh, space, a new page which is something that comics have that film doesn't, which is important to acknowledge. It's not the same as composing for animation. You're thinking about pages, and each time you turn it, and each set of pages, what are you revealing, and what are you holding back to show them when they turn the page and, and find out. So in this instance, I was you know wanted to build this tension of what's happening, what's happening, and then only reveal the full body of the pond flying away in the second page when you to it. And it's kind of, I wouldn't say the whole point of this shot, but it's definitely the central one. So all the dark and light, it's, you know, he's silhouetted, the space of the trees and, and mushroomy kind of growths around him uh, that will be sort of a dark uh, vignetting space um, are all designed to wrap around him and around this flying pond. You don't have to be um, beholden to realism or n nature, especially in the soup, but with comics in general, you get to decide what goes where and why. And each of those things can be an opportunity to reinforce the story. This forest can be any shape I want it to be, so if it's possible, I want it to be shapes that help to show the story. I'm not modeling this in 3D. I'm not moving a camera around a literal space. I can fudge things and make it wrap around the composition in a way that tells the story to its maximum extent. It would be a real bummer if I were moving a camera around and there were a, a big mushroom tree right directly dead center in the way. So creating this next shot, this final one, was, uh, again, I wanted to, to humanize this moment. It's nice to have a big moment of awe. I find it, and it's something I've done with Jellybots before, uh, something that I, I'm going to have to explore alternatives to because I don't want to just repeat things that I know I, I know how to do. Uh, but I wanted to, now that we've seen this moment, it's almost through his eyes. I mean, it's behind him, but we're seeing it through a similar viewpoint from down we're looking up again it's he's small and central but the whole world is big and overwhelming and and this final shot we really want to know okay well how does he feel about it i want to end it on this human note um of just just a big like delighted smile on his face and I think I'm, I'm playing with the idea of a, of a single happy Ghibli tear. So I'm just, uh, when I ended on that, and then we would, if it were a film, then it would cut to black or whatever. It's like a teaser of Jellybots. Just a quick sequence of uh, <laughs> Bob Ross, Charles Darwin, scientist stepping into a world of jelly that he doesn't understand and loving it. <laughs> that's pretty much that's pretty much the story. So now I've sort of sketched in a really loose we've gone sort of a, the next step beyond thumbnail into a sketch. I'm taking some of that light and dark painting I did in the thumbnails and bringing it back up a couple layers to show you again I, I'm using the trees to silhouette things so I can create dark spaces and immersion where we're tucked into these darker spaces looking into these lighter spaces. Uh, using the lighting on him from underneath to create a silhouette. And then really quickly at the end here, uh, throwing some, some color on I'm using a multiply layer and some overlay layers to do a quick color study. And that's the start of process.
thanks so much for watching, and tune in uh, this coming month for more comics. Bye for now, guys. Cheers.